So just going to start off with some disclosures. Uh, so a, a lot of the work we've done, uh, the research being funded by the EVP, uh, also supported by Cancer Research UK, uh, and the NHS Innovation Accelerator Fellowship, uh, specific to population testing. Uh, we also work closely with lots of other community charities and support groups, including a number of uh, organizations in the Jewish community where we've done a lot of the research, uh, also uh, Boots, uh, Braca Umbrella, Overcome, uh, Your Girls. Just a bit of background to start. Uh, so our strategy is fairly simple, I'd say. Uh, it's looking at ways to better identify high-risk groups. So if we can identify high-risk groups better, we can do better screening, early diagnosis and prevention, and therefore reduce cancer incidence and reduce deaths from cancer. I believe probably the best and the most effective way to do that uh, is through population gene testing. And therefore it's a strategy that's really important and going to play an important part in the future. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you about uh, my story and research in this area. A few facts. Uh, the breast cancer cases and ovarian cancer cases are predicted to rise uh, by the International Organization of Cancer Research uh, significantly over the next 20 years. In the UK, we expect about a 20-25% rise. Across the world, it's almost a 50% rise. Also, if we've extended to other cancers, we see similar number of figures for women bowel cancers, where there's a quarter to 36% rise in the UK and almost a 50 to 70% rise the world. So the burden of cancer is increasing and will continue to increase. Specifically for, for ovary and breast, we're reasonably good at treating breast cancer, but we're not very good at treating ovary cancer. And despite various advances, regrettably, 70% of women die from the disease. And there hasn't been a huge improvement in survival over the last 20 to 30 years. So what are genes? Genes are instructions uh, in the body. So our body is made up of cells. And in these cells, we have 46 chromosomes. And these chromosomes are made up of DNA. And these DNA constitu uh, constitu constitu constituting these chromosomes are, are genes. The genes are instructions, and we have 25,000 to 30,000 genes in the body. And the gene is made up of four letters, A, T, C, and G. So imagine, imagine you're reading a book, and it's just got four letters in it. Uh, so the typical gene could potentially look something like this. If you carry on almost to page 200, that is page one of the book, that's one gene. And when we're looking for a fault in the gene, it's really like a spelling mistake. So it could be something as simple as one letter being missing, or a block of letters being missing, or an extra letter being inserted, and so on and so forth. But what it does, or it could potentially do, uh, is stop the gene from functioning normally and therefore producing the protein that it should carry out its instructions. The BRCA genes, we have two BRCA genes. The BRCA stands for breast cancer, breast cancer genes, but they cause other cancers also the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 gene. And women who carry a, a fault in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, and a few thousand of these faults have been described, uh, they put themselves at increased risk of breast cancer. They have about a 70% chance of getting breast cancer across their lifetime or to the age of 80. The normal population risk of breast cancer is about 12%. Similarly, BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene uh, mutation carriers are at increased risk of ovarian cancer, 44 about BRCA1 and 17 for BRCA2. The population level risk of ovary cancer in the UK is about 2% to 1 in 50. Men have an increased risk of prostate cancer, more common with the BRCA2 than the BRCA1, and also there's an increased risk of male breast cancer. There has been an expansion in our knowledge. 
uh, with respect to genes and cancer. But been quite exponential, I'd say, over the last decade or two. And we now know there are lots of other genes with clinical implications which cause both breast cancer, ovary cancer, womb cancer, and bowel cancer. As you see, it's not just restricted to BRCA1 and BRCA2. So there are a number of other genes in breast cancer, in particular, this PALB2. There are a number of ovary cancer genes you're going to be down. And there's a Lynch syndrome genes like MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, PMS2, and that can which cause womb and bowel cancer. The list of genes we know about and we can do something about has expanded. So why is it helpful to identify someone who's carrying a faulty gene? Well, we can predict the risk of breast of cancer and therefore we can do something to prevent it. There are various options. In someone who has a high risk of breast cancer, we can do prevention in the form of mastectomy, which will prevent someone from getting breast cancer. Ovarian cancer can be prevented by removal of the tubes and ovaries. And there's ongoing research on removal of tubes alone. There's medical prevention, the specific medicines or drugs you can give for preventing breast cancer, such as tamoxifen, aspirin for bowel cancer and womb cancer. You can have more intensive screening for breasts, which is annual and very different from the, the general population screening program. Things about planning family, reproductive, lifestyle choices, contraception choices, gene implanted and gene diagnosis is uh, technology can be used to do IVF where you can select an embryo which does not, or who does not carry the, the fault, the inheritable fault, and therefore it doesn't get passed on to the next generation. And of course, there are opportunities to participate in clinical trials. In addition, Relatives can be tested, and unaffected relatives who are identified can also avail of various options of screening and prevention. But everything has risks and benefits, and there's always a balance. So what are the downsides to gene testing? There have been issues around confidentiality, so it needs to be confidential. There could be potential insurance implications. There is a moratorium in the UK uh, with the Department of Health and Insurance co companies, which of a certain aspects of gene testing. Does it impact family dynamics? Will it emotionally impact someone? In some communities, marriageability is an issue, and some people feel stigmatization is an issue. Conventional way or the standard way in which we identify people who carry these BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes as the prime example of inheritable faults uh, is through looking at their family history and seeing if there's a strong family history of breast and ovarian cancer, for example, uh, and then offer them gene testing. And I think the poster girl for BRCA is definitely Angela Jolie, uh, who came out and said she's a BRCA1 carrier and went on to have a mastectomy and her tubes and ovaries removed for preventing breast and ovarian cancer. And this is her family history, you can see. Uh, um, Mothers had ovarian and, and breast cancer, her aunt had breast cancer, and the grandmother had ovarian cancer. So you have a celebrity who's switched on, uh, has complete access to the best medical care, and the opportunity to find out she has a BRCA1 gene and prevent herself from getting breast and ovarian cancer. Um, there are limitations to this approach. Uh, unfortunately, not everybody would who carries a BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene mutation fulfill the sort of clinical criteria that we use today. In fact, it misses over half the people at risk. How many of us know about our family history and will act on it? There's limited awareness, and you need to jump through multiple hoops in most health systems to be able to access gene testing. We did an analysis across a 16 million London population and looked at the gene testing data from labs and matched it postcode and an estimate of how many people across the London population may carry the BRCA genes. We found that 97% of the people who actually carried the BRCA genes, despite a couple of decades of NHS testing, have not yet been identified. And there's emerging data, now there's good data from other countries also, which shows that the way the current system works is there's huge underutilization of testing, and maybe one in five people who are eligible access it. So we have a situation where not many people access testing, even if the system was working at 100% efficiency, it misses half the people at risk. 
and the vast majority of people at risk still remain unidentified. So I don't think it's very effective. If we model the rates of testing, and this is the sort of rate of testing in, across the London population, and you can see there's, there's this increase, a good increase from 2007 onwards, but if we still, if we model it, uh, there'll always be a proportion who are undetectable and don't fulfill the criteria of testing. And even if we double the rate, we have to wait for 200 years to pick up the people at risk. So I think we need alt to explore alternative options. The other thing I don't understand is why we need to wait for people to get cancer, because that's how our current system works, to identify other people who we can prevent cancer. If we switch to a new paradigm of population testing, it gets rid of this. But that has its challenges. So we asked ourselves uh, the question, the can we test populations for these cancer genes, and particularly the BRCA gene? And we started working, doing research in this area, I think it was 2007, 2008, way back then. So what are the issues? Do we pick up more people at risk? Are these people high risk? What is the impact on your emotional well-being, your psychology, your quality of life? Do people find it acceptable? Is it cost-effective? Talk a bit about that. And clearly, we need new approaches for delivery because not everybody can come into a hospital and have a test. We're going to test everybody. A few other important principles to bear in mind when one does gene testing. The test needs to be reliable and accurate. We must understand the association of the test and the fault with the cancer risk. There must be something we can do about that level of cancer risk. There's no point doing a test if there's nothing we can do about it. And of course, we need to understand the ethical, legal, and social implications. And this is some very nice work we just put together in what's called the ASWE, uh, my colleagues from the Public Health Foundation. So I think if we did population testing, we could pick up more people at risk, optimize risk prediction, and offer better decision-making, more informed decision-making, options of surgical and medical prevention, and ultimately reduce incidence of cancer and deaths from cancer. The first study we did, and uh, one of the big studies we did, was in the Jewish community, and it's called GCAPS, it's Genetic Cancer Prediction of Population Screening. Uh, we invited uh, men and women from the Ashkenazi Jewish community to join the study and find out if they carried a BRCA gene mutation we did it through six community centers uh, across North London. And we divided people randomly into two groups. In one group, we tested everybody. And in one group, we only tested those who fulfilled the current NHS current criteria for gene testing. And we looked at various issues I mentioned, impact on psychological well-being, quality of life, impact the test result, excuse me number of BRCA carriers were identified and the health economics or the cost to the health system. Was we worked very closely with lots of collaborators and community groups uh, that I mentioned earlier. And over the last four years or so, we've published a number of outcomes uh, from the study in scientific peer review journals and I'll summarize these in the next couple of slides. So what did we find? We found that in the North London population, around 2.9%, which is consistent with other reports in the world, uh, Ashkenazi Jews carry a BRCA mutation. Sort of equ equally split between BRCA1 and BRCA2, and 60% of these would not fulfill the current criteria for gene testing. For those who had a strong family history, almost 9 to 10% carried a BRCA mutation, or fulfilled the current gene testing criteria. And those without a strong family history, 2% carry the BRCA mutation. We also looked at different ways to counsel women. So we did it in a community setting and we used a decision tool, which is a DVD, which we developed 
and, and we found that it's possible to provide pretest counseling in more efficient ways in the community setting using a dvd based counseling approach or group counseling approach was similar and not inferior uh, to the standard counseling approach of seeing someone on a one-to-one -one basis and it was more time and cost efficient So the current model of clearly family history based testing had a number of limitations. 60% of carriers don't have a strong family history of cancer that can be identified by population testing. We found that population testing was feasible, acceptable in the Ashkenazi Jewish population and had high satisfaction. We did not find any harm to psychological health and quality of life when we compared the outcomes between the two forms of testing, i.e. population testing and standard criteria based testing. We found a reduction in anxiety and distress and uncertainty with time, particularly in the short term, and no difference in quality of life, health, anxiety, and depression scores between the two groups. Recently, continued to follow, follow volunteers up for three years after the study, after the test result, and we published those data. And what we did find was that population testing had a significant reduction in anxiety compared to family history testing. So there's greater reduction in anxiety. This um, I'd say is a statistical number rather than being clinically meaningful. But the important thing is that it was not in the reverse direction. And again, no difference in depression, uncertainty, overall impact of quality of life, the distress score. Distress and health anxiety reduced used with time with both population and family history testing. We didn't find any difference in diet, exercise, lifestyle, alcohol or routine breastfeeding uptake following population testing. So people who were maybe tested negative didn't change their lifestyle to start smoking more or drinking more or not exercising adequately or not going for routine mammograms and so on. This I've already mentioned, so I'll skip this. Once, when exploring the attitudes towards uptake of gene testing, we've, the study showed that there was good interest when people came forward. Obviously, they're coming forward to find out about the study. There was only about 60% intention upfront, but then ultimately, 88% uptake. The most common and important reason for people to undergo testing was reassurance to reduce uncertainty. And those who were married and cohabiting were four times more likely to take it up. We published these data last year. We also recognize the limitations uh, associated with gene testing or BRCA testing, and the, those who were concerned about the downturn, downsides of testing related to insurance or confidentiality, emotional impact, etc., were less likely to take up BRCA testing. And this, these issues discriminated between those who took it up and those who declined it, which is, which is important. Uh, it means that people make informed decisions for themselves, depending on what they would prefer to do or not do. A lot, one of the things that's critically important when one looks at new interventions and new things is that, is it economically sustainable? Uh, and can the health system afford it? Uh, so, underpinning a lot of our research is, is economic analysis, and, and we did this when we published uh, in three cost-effectiveness analysis papers uh, on population testing in the Jewish population, and in fact, the NHS Innovation Accelerator also, um, a lot of this work has been independently reviewed by, by the York uh, University Health Economics Group, and I think their papers also just uh, being about to come out, so there's an independent review of all this work. Uh, and we're looking at comparing the costs and the consequences. So the costs are the costs of everything, cost of gene testing, the cost of cancer treatment or prevention or chemo prevention and so on. The consequences is the health benefits or the deaths from cancer. And you compare that for both alternatives and do an economic evaluation and reach a decision. Uh, so 
terminology used in health economic analysis is something called quality. Quality is your survival multiplied by something called a utility score. A utility score uh, is an estimate of your quality of life. So if one imagines that death is zero and perfect health is one, then no matter what situation we are in life, we could choose a number between zero and one and say, I feel my quality of life on, on the zero to one scale is say 0.9 or one. Or if I have first stage ovary cancer, it'll be different. If I have stage three ovary cancer, it'll be different. If I have stage one breast cancer, it may be different. If I fracture my leg, it may be different. But it gives you a number which you can compare about across different disease conditions and therefore it's very useful in economic analysis. So NICE uses something in other health institutions or, or also use uh, or other health systems also use something called an incremental cost effectiveness ratio, which is complex maths to get to, but in a sense it's simplified in, in the terms that it's really the cost of population testing in this situation minus the total cost of family history testing divided by the health benefit or quality benefit of population testing minus the quality benefit of family history testing. So the new intervention and the old intervention. And NICE says that it's willing to spend between 20 to 30 thousand pounds for each quality gain. That's quality adjusted life here. If we have this, so this we have two lines here, one's on costs and one's on health benefit. We have a situation where something is more costly and less beneficial. It's not rocket science, we should not adopt it. If we have a situation where something is really beneficial and cheaper, it totally makes sense to adopt it. And for things in between, they have decision rules. And as I mentioned, the decision rule for NICE uh, is a 30,000 pound per quality. That, for example, for the US health system is usually considered at about $100,000 for quality. In Europe, it ranges from 30,000 to 50,000 euros for quality, and WHO and other has also guidelines on this. So, what did our cost effectiveness analysis of population bracket testing uh, show? Uh, so, so we found that clearly it, it saves both more lives and qualities, and it was cost saving. Uh, it's associated with a gain in life expectancy, reduced breast and ovarian cancer incidence, and save about 280 ovary and 500 breast cancer cases, and save the NHS 3.7 million pounds. Uh, that's around 2015. So we paid for now. I don't think there are a huge number of interventions in medicine that can save both lives and money, but definitely population-based bracket testing, the Jewish population is one of them. Similar to the, I won't say similar, but just as we did uh, work in, in the UK, there have been studies also running uh, across the world. Uh, in particular, uh, Stephen Arrell's team did a single arm study in Canada, um, colleague Efret Levi Lehar run a big population testing study in Israel. And currently, there are two ongoing studies. One is in Australia, led by Leslie Andrews. And the other is the B4 study that I can offer to Judy Garber, so we Tom Check and colleagues in the States. Again, the data I published from these studies are sort of corroborate our, our findings from the UK. Uh, these are single arm studies. In, um, study we did was a randomized trial. So we had a, a consortium meeting and we built what's called the PREDICT consortium. So we met last year, middle of last year. We couldn't meet this year because of COVID. Uh, and this was a population BRCA found in mutation detection consortium, uh, which in its nascent phase uh, to take forward population testing. Jewish population, there's colleagues from the various studies coming across uh, to take this work forward. I do feel that it's time to change paradigm to population testing in the Jewish population and there's good evidence and data to support it. And what we need now is to have the implementation models implemented across uh, different populations. So moving on beyond population testing for the Jewish population and moving a bit beyond BRCA testing, uh, we also looked at testing a panel of 
the cost effectiveness of testing a panel of breast milk ovarian cancer genes. So I showed you at the beginning, there are a number of genes which may be associated with breast milk ovarian cancer, and therefore we test for more genes and we do more about it and we can prevent more cancers. Uh, and we analyzed population testing versus clinical criteria testing for the US and UK health systems uh, for a panel of genes and showed that it was cost effective both in the US and UK context and could prevent a huge number of uh, ovarian and breast cancer cases per, per million population. And if you convert that into population based estimates, you can see that it could, it could prevent 60,000 breast and 70,000 ovary cancers in the U, uh, UK and over 200,000 breast and 65,000 ovary cancers in, in the US. But this could potentially have global implications if you look at it from a paradigm chain perspective, or a perspective, which is the way I look at it. Um, so it could be applicable across different health systems. And uh, a couple of months ago, we published uh, this paper uh, comparing population testing across different health systems, whether it's high income countries, upper middle income countries, and low income countries. And the examples we used were the UK, US, and Netherlands. China, Brazil, uh, and India, that's low middle income country. Uh, that's Lee, a uh, postdoc in my team, who did a lot of the work in model building. So we found, I'm not showing you a lot of detail of the paper, but we found that it was cost effective uh, for high income countries uh, as well as upper middle income countries. Uh, and basically, cost saving in high income countries, if you looked at it from the societal perspective. There are two different ways to look at cost effectiveness analysis, payer perspective and societal perspective. In the low income countries, and the cost of testing needs to fall further. And in the low middle income countries like India, it may become cost effective if it, when it hits about $170, we estimated. But if you look at the potential impact, so then I think if you extrapolate it to population and put potential cancers you can prevent, you can see the numbers are quite large depending on which country you're looking at. Uh, with similar numbers uh, for the US, the UK, then if you look at China, million breast cancers, 150 ovary cancers, and again, huge numbers in, in India. Uh, this uh, is just, there've been lots of commentaries in the literature uh, on population testing. Some number written by us and some by other colleagues, uh, which are worth reading if for those who are interested in this. We also uh, ran some general population surveys as part of the PROMISE program, uh, which is something you're involved in. And we found that there is about an 85% interest. 70% of people said they have an intention to alter their lifestyle and health behavior uh, and take up screening and prevention. Uh, we had population testing and they found out about their cancer risk, ovarian cancer risk. So moving beyond just high-risk genes, what, what is quite topical today and what is happening is that you can, the various factors which are associated with the risk, there's reproductive factors, whether you take a pill or not, the number of children you had, when you had your periods, how old you are, you have a family history, you're looking at breast cancer, what's the breast density? Um, so, and then you have genetic factors. You can also have what's called epigenetic factors. What you can put all these together, genetic factors can be the genes we spoke about, but also something called SNPs, just small changes in, in genes which uh, are common, but associated with small changes in risk only. But if you put all of them together and you can use a complex AI type algorithm, you can get a value of cancer risk and a lot of the research now is focused around building these models and validating, that means making sure that the cancer risk it produces is actually the cancer risk that people get. Uh, so you can get a personalized cancer risk and you can use that then therefore to test people's population and divide them into different groups. Those who are really high risk, those who are moderate risk, those who are low risk, you don't need to worry about. And depending on the risk, made use different strategies to prevent a screen for cancer. I think that's where sort of the future direction of travel is likely to be. So we uh, did a pilot study which we published uh, just a little while ago 
uh, where we went into uh, low risk population in North London and uh, asked a little over 100 women of whether they want to find out about their ovarian cancer risk using the sort for bottle and testing for lots of genes. Um, and just look at the feasibility and acceptability of this approach. Uh, we use sort of a digital application or a web based tool with women having the option to access a helpline for further information uh, and support. Uh, and uh, the consent uh, did the gene testing, did the modeling, and this was a validated model that was used uh, and fed back the urine cancer uh, list result. And then followed up uh, patients for up to six months. So we found that 85% of the people who were interested and consented uh, to have the gene test, 90, a little over 90% were satisfied. Um, with the decision aid and the overall satisfaction, depending on how you calculate it, ranges between 86 and 99%. One in 13%, so one in about seven people, uh, one in eight people used the decision aid, uh, the telephone helpline, sorry. And people who used, wanted access to the helpline, we found were those who were a bit more anxious. We didn't find any overall change in psychological outcomes or quality of life scores following giving back the result over in cancer worry and cancer risk perception decreased over the next six months. So this study showed that general population testing for personalized over in cancer risk stratification was feasible, acceptable, and high satisfaction, and reduced cancer worry and risk perception. I think population testing is about offering more choice and options. It's about early detection and cancer prevention, and it's about saving more lives than we currently can do with other clinical strategies. It's made possible because of the falling costs of gene testing. Costs have fallen drastically over the last 10 to 12 years. When I began working in this area, uh, doing my research and my PhD, uh, with Professor Ian Jacobs and Ushaman, and the cost of bracket testing used to be something like two, two and a half thousand pounds. You can get it for $200 today. There's technological advancements, so you can do high throughput screening, so you can do large scale mass testing, and there's increasing societal awareness and acceptance of these methods. I'm going to use an analogy, which, uh, so imagine you want to buy a can of Coke, or you want to drink a Coke, so you can go into Poshest bar, and that's Mahiti, I think, where royalty goes, uh, and it'll might you must spend a bomb for it. I said maybe thirty pounds. You can go to the Ritz. Um, they charge you five, six. Costs about three quid there, and you can go into a supermarket and spend forty-five p for the same can of Coke. I think we're probably at the gastro pub stage as far as gene testing goes. So we're moving between the river bar and the gastro pub stage. We moved away from this phase, but we are on our way to the supermarket stage. And that's where I think the costs will become so low and the drivers are so big that it will eventually be a no brainer. Another sort of analogy, I mean, who knew 100 years ago when these two gentlemen flew the first plane, which looked like this, 50 years later, I mean, it'd be like this. And as the costs, if you look at the airline industry, started falling, now low cost flying uh, has completely, had completely revolutionized the way we travel in the airline industry. You could, spend, instead of spending a few thousand pounds, spend 150 pounds in flight to New York. Uh, so I think all industries have their shakeups. Uh, and genomics and gene testing and its applicability to health is not unique. So the way forward, uh, clearly, of course, we need more research. We are trying to raise funding for a large population panel gene testing study, looking at multiple genes, multiple cancer types, uh, working with colleagues and collaborators right across the UK, across all the major academic health science centers, uh, and across and with colleagues internationally also. So do we prevent more cancers through population testing? Yes, we do. Do we identify more people at risk? Yes. 
are we causing more harm? No, I don't believe so. Is there high satisfaction? Yes. Is it feasible and acceptable? Yes. Can we do it outside the hospital setting? Definitely. Is it cost effective? Yes, I think it is. We demonstrated a number of studies. There are important principles to bear in mind. One is clinical utility. So we should not do it for stuff we can't do anything about. The list of things we can do it for with evolve over time. We think about equity and equal access. And socioeconomic status of people in the underprivileged. And I don't think there'll be one system, one size fits all system for eventually delivering population testing. The delivery model and management pathways are important. And these will need to be con context and health system and country specific. We do need more research into general population testing with long-term outcomes, just like we've done in the Jewish population. We need to understand and better manage the US. The US is variance of uncertain significance. We need a bit more long-term cost effectiveness data. And we need to get the public messaging right. Uh, and just a big thank you to lots of colleagues and collaborators involved across the UK and, and the world and, and the work uh, we've done. Uh, colleagues at uh, UCL and collaborator uh, Ian Jacobs and UNSW, uh, also my collaborator Rosella Kurt at the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, do a lot of work with colleagues in Manchester, Cambridge, uh, Anthony Gareth, colleagues at Queen Mary University of London, uh, University of Leeds, VUMC, India, Brazil. Uh, the GCAP study collaborators were instrumental in getting this whole idea and work started. And the promise team which was involved in doing a general population study. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ranji. That was su such a great insight into your work. And, you know, I really like that you are including an e economic evaluation, which is crucial for getting new interventions adopted into the healthcare system. So thank you so much. Um, I have a couple of questions that I'll ask you now, but if anyone wants to ask any questions, just pop them in the Q&A box and I can ask them now. Um, great, so let's kick off with, if you could introduce this model tomorrow, how would you get the government to adopt this strategy? So a big question. That's a million dollar question. Trying to do that for Jewish population testing. I think uh, decision makers need to change testing guidelines uh, and policy. Uh, the evidence and the scientific evidence to support it for testing in the Jewish population is there. So it, it's a question of policy makers changing policy and making it available. I think. The way one would deliver it uh, would be a digital uh, web based. You can technology, it will be done remotely and virtually. It doesn't, you don't need people coming into hospital. Yeah. Um, so that model is well established. Uh, it's we've shown that the uh, it's cost effective and cost saving, in fact, to do it. Uh, and so I think it's a no brainer. Uh, but there's a huge, I think there's a bridge to travel between accumulating the scientific evidence and showing the benefit and then getting that changed into policy. Uh, and there is no one strategy to to bridge that gap. Uh, but the NIA uh, is helping do that at the moment in this context. Great, thank you. And then we had a question through, um, I have uh, ticked BRCA, but I have actually got the RAD51D gene mutation. My sister had ovarian cancer and also has the gene. Please can yes. you benefits of a total hysterectomy in postmenopausal women with the, the RAD 51D gene mutation. Okay, uh, so the RAD 51 gene mutation uh, is associated with about 13 approximately, the latest data suggests, yeah. lifetime risk of, uh, of ovarian cancer. Um, and uh, we, uh, it's a good example of, you know, increasing utility of gene testing and moving beyond BRCA to identify other people who are at risk and whom we can prevent cancer. I think the 
main preventive operation needed with the RAD51D gene is a bilateral salpingo oophorectomy. That means the removal of both tubes and ovaries. You don't need a full hysterectomy in my view. Uh, so even in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 carriers, we don't routinely do a full hysterectomy unless there is an indication for another reason. Uh, there is the, so this is the other surgical prevention option is if someone's premenopausal and they've completed their family is to remove the tubes only uh, because most of these cancers come from the tubes and to preserve hormonal function, uh, take the ovaries out at a later date uh, of the patient's choosing. This is uh, to enable women who may wish to delay having both tubes and ovaries out the opportunity to reduce the cancer risk. That's only available within the research context. It's available to rad 51 d carriers also. We're running a study, a national study called the Protector Trial, uh, in which this is available. It, hysterectomy, I think, is, is warranted uh, if there are other gynecological reasons to do a hysterectomy. Um, it, it's rad 51 d is not associated with an increased risk of womb cancer. Cervix cancer is not linked to this gene mutation which is caused by a wart virus. Uh, so I don't think there is added benefit from a cancer risk reduction perspective to be gained by uh, taking the right, by taking the womb out, and that's a much bigger operation with higher uh, risk of complications. So I would not really either advise it or suggest it. But yeah. definitely remo removing both the tubes and ovaries uh, is a sensible option because uh, it's associated with a high enough risk at which we would offer it and support that. Thank you. And then we've got a really good question here. Um, do you think we'll see population testing offered to everybody in the next five years? Uh, if I was to wish for something in life, my topmost would be that. <laughs> but I, I don't think it will be offered in, I hope it does. I don't think it will be offered to everybody. I don't think policy makers will change policy for everyone in the next five years. Yeah. I think they will want to see more data accumulate. So we are in the process of trying to do that. Um, at least in, in this country, I think. Um, I think it, I sincerely hope it will change for high risk populations like the Jewish population. And there are, I haven't shown on the slide, but the other founder populations across the world. Um, which is that this has direct implications, and in all those populations, I think you could you could do testing. Um, I think you may find in some other countries that people might change policy and take it up. This is uh, things may move very quickly. We the world is grappling grappling with the COVID pandemic. I think. Yeah. So I think that's also going to take a hit in terms of you know, play into economic decision making in the future and where governments invest money. Uh, I. There's no doubt in my mind that we need to focus a lot more around, of course, I'm biased, I work in the area, but I, I, the stats show you that unless health systems get a better handle on preventing disease, there is a chance of them going bankrupt in the years to come, just trying to treat disease without trying to prevent enough of it. And this offers using genes to pick up people at high risk, which BRCA is the prime example, offers a huge opportunity and a model to prevent cancers in the future. In fact, it's not just, you know, it can, it can be used in a model for preventing other chronic disease also. Uh, so I hope it does, but I, I'm sure it will for the Jewish population. And I think we'll be well on our way for it being adopted or people talking about adopting it in the future for the general population. But uh, policymakers may not change it in five years, but definitely in 10 years, I hope. Great, thank you so much. And I think that's all the questions we have for now, unless anyone wants to get one in really quickly. But I think I'll wrap up there. So thank you all for joining our session today. We really appreciate your interest and support. And a big thank you to Ranjit for taking the time out of his very busy schedule, I'm sure. Um, and you can find more sessions to join on the Staying Connected part of our website including patient support groups and yeah again thank you for joining us and i hope you all have a lovely weekend and look forward to seeing you at a research webinar in the future great thank you ranji and yeah have a lovely thank you very much everyone <laughs>